You've heard AM. You've heard FM. Now, tune into DM Radio, the world's longest running show about data. Each week, host Eric Cavanaugh interviews the brightest minds in the world of information management. Want to be on the show? Send an email to info at dmradio.biz. Now, here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, ladies and gentlemen, hello and welcome back once again to DM Radio. Yours truly, Eric Cavanaugh, here in year 16 of the world's longest running show about data. We've learned a lot and I'm excited today to have a couple old friends on the show and a new friend as well. We're going to talk about data exchanges. This is something that I thought was going to be hot about 15 years ago. It took a little bit longer than I thought, but uh, there are lots and lots of reasons for that. But these days, my oh my, is data being bought and sold all day, every day, large contracts, amazing things can happen. So why does that happen? Why do companies buy data? Well, lots of different reasons. Insurance companies like to buy data to learn more about maybe whether or not they should insure a certain per person or a certain type of event, for example. That's very useful. Retailers are curious to know what's hot, which colors are hot, who's buying what and where and when. Uh, all sorts of financial institutions are curious to understand what's happening because they have to hedge their own bets. We saw what happened with Silicon Valley Bank. They didn't hedge their bets very well. They didn't manage their portfolio very well, and they collapsed. Poof. That was a bit of a shock. Uh, sent shockwaves through uh, the whole industry, frankly, that I'm in. I bet probably a third to half of the money I've made over the last 25 years at some point went through Silicon Valley Bank. Well, there you go. You have to know what the market is doing. You have to understand what's happening all around you in order to do the best job of deciding how to provision your resources. So today we're going to be hearing from uh, Andy Hanna. He is the proprietor of the founder of 1486 Labs right here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's excited to connect with someone where I live these days. I'm up in the North Hills, but we'll also hear from my buddy Eugene Burke, who's from around here, but now he's on the eastern side. Uh, he says he's not a Phillies fan now. He's uh, more of a Pirates fan. So that's that's good to hear. Cool. And uh, my my good buddy Damian Black is out there as well. He's going to be asking some questions about what this stuff all means. So uh, one thing I'll throw out there before I bring in uh, Andy is this story of Google getting rid of third-party cookies. I think they extended it till this coming year. I'd have to look up to see what the details are. But that's a pretty big deal for marketers, for digital marketers. Third-party cookies, pretty important data source. And so if that really does go away, what does it mean? It means you're going to have to really understand your first party data, and you're going to probably have to go out and buy some third party data to uh, to better understand. And that's where 1486 Labs comes in, I think. But Andy, you tell me, what are you working on? Uh, tell us about 1486. Yeah, you, you got it. 1486 is actually an entrepreneurial lab that we set up at the University of Pittsburgh about two years ago. And based on um, my career, you know, bought and sold a lot of data, built companies, machine learning companies around data, um, organized data. And, and what we found is that, as you might imagine, in a trillion dollar market, there's a lot of inefficiencies in the buying and selling of data. You know, we, we, we spent two years researching sort of what are the problems? Why don't we have a more efficient market for uh uh, for the buying and selling of 30 third party data. And it largely revolves around what you would expect. It's a lack of transparency around cost and quality. And um, it's not sure, it's it's hard to find um, sellers of, of data that may be unique, that'll drive your, your algorithms. So mm -hmm. price, quality, choice, those are the main the main factors that we're trying to help break down those uh, those inefficiencies. Yeah, tell us a bit about the kinds of data. So I mentioned retail data, you know, there's certainly manufacturing data you could look into. There's a lot of financial data that can be purchased. What kinds of data do you see that is readily accessible that you are exchanging right now on your in your system? Okay, so we're not we're not the actual exchange. Just uh, we're we are an organizer of buyers of data who can um, who can. Uh, uh, work together to understand what data would be the best to um, to fix, fill their use cases. So through what um, you know the algorithms that they're using or the the uh, the analytics that they're using. Hmm. So we help those buyers and sellers find each other and make the process more seamless in terms of their 
um, their transactions. But to answer your questions, I mean, we, we focus a lot around uh, healthcare, retail, and finance. And when you think about um, healthcare as an example, there's such a drive and such a need for what's known as real world data. So information about patients who have certain disease states and and uh, the amount that they're paying you know, for insurance or insurance premiums, as an example, their um, their paths for for um, um, carrying the problem. And so there's about 50 of those data providers out there, and they're all uh, all focused on something a little different, a different disease state. So we're trying to help the buyers of that data sort through who has the best data for the particular use case for a particular disease state. Hmm. So that's it's it's sorting through all the mess that it would take for an individual company to go through and analyze that, and we're making it easier for them. That's interesting. So what kind of a system do you use for doing that? I'm guessing you've got some kind of a database or a directory or some kind of a, yeah. a shared space where people will enter information about their experiences yeah, with things. Yeah, that, that's exactly right. I'm, so we uh, everything that we do is focused on a use case. So, um, in, and I think that's one of the really unique things. There's not a great um, comprehensive database, a very detailed database about use cases and analytics. Of course, Doug Laney has done great work, and you can read his book, Data Juice. I know Doug. And, I know him well. Uh, you know, it has a great summary of those use cases, but we tend to go a lot in depth, like what algorithms are people using? What are, what's the, the internal data, the first party data that you're using? What are the types of external data? So we, we create that use case, and we have 16 of them up on our community now, and that's where we attract uh, members to um, learn about those use cases or refine their knowledge of the use cases and then connect directly into third-party providers of data that could help um, fulfill their, their needs for data in those, uh, in those use cases. So it's that facilitation of that process. And you know, our, our hope is by bringing lots of buyers uh, together with lots of sellers, we're going to get much more of a, a market dynamic for, for data than we currently have. That's interesting. So um, what gave you this idea? Did you just look around and say, no one's doing this and we got to go do this? Or was there some other impetus that got you all excited about it? Well, you know, I, it's been, I've been working with data since the uh, mid 1990s when we were focused on mining data. The company I was with was called Internet Securities. And we were mining data out of the former Soviet Union. The, you know, the wall had just fallen and these countries were trying to become privatized, you know, the, the industries were trying to privatize, the, they were trying to become free market economies. And so we literally parachuted people in 27 countries around the world and mined data out. Wow. And back, <laughs> back in the mid 1990s. That's it crazy. Was, you know, it was hard. <laughs> and by the way, you know, we, we like to say we were one of the first SaaS based company. We put that data up on the internet and put some, uh, uh, large banks on the internet for the first time to pull this data down. It was really the wild west. And, and, you know, it's, so that was the beginning of my understanding. And, and so the businesses I've had along the way, I've had to buy a lot of data. I've sold a lot of data, use a lot of data. And it's just like so hard, so inefficient. And I'm like, why isn't it easier? Hmm. And so finally, that's why, you know, we started uh, working on this concept of how do we make it easier because it's so damn hard. Um, and that's why we uh, we formed this company. Yeah, that that's really interesting. And maybe I'll throw one more question at you before we bring in Eugene and then maybe Damien in the second segment here. But, you know, the data, of course, is being used extensively to train algorithms these days. And if you look at like OpenAI with ChatGPT, you, you, I talked to Damien the other day. He actually gave me some really good insights about how some of these LLMs are working and how they're trying to lower the error rate to get closer and closer to what the user wants to see in terms of text reflected back to them. You've got Facebook and LinkedIn and Instagram and all these guys are using the the interaction data, all kinds of data. I mean, the images that are being thrown out there, the words that are being thrown, the you know main topics, their ontologies, are all kinds of things you can do. So there's tons and tons and tons of data being used to train algorithms, is that something that you think you're facilitating as well, or are you really more facilitating around granular data to be used today to make business decisions? 
No, it, it's so they're they're the use cases are focused on an analytic outcome. Okay. So um, it is, you know, it might be fraud detection as an example. If you're interested in fraud detection and you're in the higher education industry because you want to understand whether or not um, some of the the applicants are fraudulent or or putting fraudulent information in there, that, that's a new use of a fraud algorithm and imagine the people who are in that business trying to learn about how to build those algorithms for the first time so what we do is we allow them to as opposed to having to search the internet and say who's doing what in fraud right. and what type of right. what type of algorithms and what type of data we say here it is all in one place come learn about it here and i know oh, by the way you need to buy you need to buy data so that you can have better outcomes for your algorithms we'll connect you into into sellers who can help you out so yeah, I mean we're well, we're not training algorithms. We're we're helping um, companies and people and organizations figure out, you know, how how to put those pieces together. Yeah, that's really cool stuff. I think it's a fantastic idea for a business. It's an enabling business, basically. You know, a lot of times you need enablers to kind of sit between as a liaison between this organization and that organization to educate, to empower, to train, essentially, and to facilitate that process. Because you're right, if you don't know how to do it, you're going to spend a lot of time probably and probably not get a very good result at the end of the day. So it helps to have a trusted partner kind of guide you along that way, right? Yep. That's a great way to think. I, we'd love to be a, a trusted partner. I think that's exactly the words that we would love to hear people say about us. All right. I'm glad I got it right. Uh, let me bring in uh, Eugene Burke to comment on this. And uh, Eugene, you and I talk about these things all the time. You know, We do. We do. Uh, so, Andy, if it, is it fair to then to say that not being the broker, you're really acting as the Sherpa and helping companies kind of find their way up and over the Himalayas because very few companies have made this foray into sourcing their own third party data to build elaborate, uh, say, fraud detection models. For example, healthcare, this is a pressing emergency kind of need. Can you describe a couple of the customers have sought you out for, if Sherpa is the right word, a good word, how have you helped them? Yeah, th thanks for the question. I think Sherpa is, is a great word. We, you know, in our buyer journey discovery process, you know, we want to be the guide. So you use Sherpa, we, we use the word guide. And um, our objective, make the people who are responsible for using this data and buying this data the heroes of their organization, whether it's a better outcome or a lower cost, higher quality, you know, um, whatever, whatever they're trying to achieve, we want to make them the hero of their organization. Um, so one of the things to really make sure we, we level set on um, here is that uh, Blue Street Data, which is our platform, www.blue, um, is sorry, I had to get that in there, Eric. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, but it's all right. but uh, you know, we we launched two weeks ago, so we are brand new. We we over the past uh, year, you know, um, you met Carissa earlier. She, uh, her, and her team have found um we 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 built 2000 followers in a very short amount of time and uh, now we're porting them over to blue street data to help them we've been educating through linkedin um but um to to answer your question eugene we we have companies who come to us and say hey i got to buy this big data set it cost me $600,000 a year i want this particular slab of it and company x will not sell me the slab can you help us understand where the alternatives to that slab is? Right. And so we're we're fortunate enough that we went out and we found three slabs that would sell them that data directly. So that's a good example of that. Hmm. Uh, I'm sorry, Eric, were you going to? No, no, go ahead. That's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, other examples are, you know, I, I buy a billion dollars of, of data a year. Very large company. Okay. And the, there's so many vendors. I'm just not sure what I'm getting value out of and what I'm not getting value out of. You know, so I know I need this external data. I just don't know which is the good, which is what's driving our outcome. Um, these are the types of questions that, that get posed to us, um, which is what's building our solution. You know, we don't want to be a consulting firm. 
but we want to make it easy um, for for companies to be able to sort through those types of issues and say, oh, okay, here's here's what it, here's everybody in my community is working on this problem, and here's how they're rating sort of the quality of the data that they're getting, so that we can sort of provide that that um, perspective uh, to the buyers. Hmm. Yeah, that's good stuff. Because there are lots of details to be sorted through, right? And if you're, if you're a company where you're buying a billion dollars worth of data a year, that's there are a lot, a lot of different data sources. I mean, I have noticed in the very recent past, the data mesh conversations are starting to get more and more linked to data contracts. So mm -hmm. we're starting to see some of the more sophisticated buyers out there pay attention to how they can use data mesh to more accurately determine which data should get used where, to help decide how much to pay for it, et cetera. But I guess this stuff is pretty fluid right now. I mean, what's your take on that, uh, Andy? Is the, is the situation changing significantly now or have you seen an inflection point or is it yet to come? Yeah, not, it, it's yet to come. I mean, I think we forget because we live in the data world and we right. kind of live on the edge. <laughs> we, we sort of forget that 80% of the world is still trying <laughs> to figure a lot of this out. Right. You know, yeah. and there's... The, you know, there's very few Amazon. There's a reason why those companies are at the top of the S and P 500, right? They know how to use the data. They know, you know, they're on the edge. Right. The vast majority are in level two out of five, right. and those are the ones that are just saying, "I've got to get into this. I got to do it the right way." So we're we're nowhere near that inflection point. In fact, it's like the haves and the have-nots. It just, you know, with retail media networks, with all these uses of data, you know, the the third party um, cookies going away from good. I mean, that's going to drive everybody into whatever you want to call it, a wall garden or retail media networks or what it's going to make them more sophisticated, knowing their comp their data and their customers better. What about the other 80 percent of the organizations who don't even know what a retail media network is? You know, it's it's an interesting stage that we're in with this haves and have nots. And we're trying to level that playing field a bit. Yeah, I think that's a great cause because you're right. I mean, we are in the data industry. And so we're keen to these developments and technologies and processes and, and the use cases and what they can do. And you can learn a lot from purchasing data, but you do need to understand how to put it in context. I think a lot of times it is being used to train algorithms to, to really to do a sanity check probably as well for companies looking at their first party data, thinking, okay, we think this is really what's happening out there. Let's just go ahead and check and see what we can buy. I would venture to say that's probably a pretty cool use case, but we'll pick that up after the break, folks. We're talking to several experts today about data exchanges, including Anna Han Andy Hanna from 1486 Labs and Blue Street Data, which just launched a couple of weeks ago. We'll be right back. You're listening to DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. All right, folks, welcome back here to DM Radio. We're having a fantastic conversation here with several experts. We've got Andy Hanna of 1486 Labs and Blue Street Data. Our analyst buddy, Eugene Burke, and Damian Black of SQL Stream is on the line as well. And, you know, in the break there, we were just chatting about uh, some of the different use cases around this stuff. And, uh, it is. It reminds me of the early days of email marketing, and when you know, I would get all these emails, people trying to sell me lists of emails. I'm like, mm, I don't think it sounds too good. And I tried one time, and I got burned because there was a little plant in there that someone had put. Which you know, if they get an email, they go, "Aha! Someone sold this data." Boom! They ding your email service provider, and uh, and you have some problems on your hands. So that is still out there. But I will say. The data scraping business is alive and well. We use uh, Seamless.ai to get contact information. It's very powerful. And it's not even really a database. It's a real-time engine, from what they tell me, that just reaches out across the web, pulls all this information together. They must have some persistence. I don't believe they don't have a database. I'm pretty sure they do, or at least some standard, because then they score things. They do other stuff. But... It's like you can get email addresses, you can get phone numbers. You know, when the in the old days of the phone, you could have the the yellow pages, and you would actually call and look at the yellow pages and call them. Like, wow, it's crazy back then. 
but now you can scrape data. So a lot of that stuff's going on. But uh, I think this industry does need a level of sophistication. And it sounds like you folks are really focused on trying to provide that. And it is consulting. It's guidance. It's being the Sherpa, if you will. So tell us a bit about you know how you see things going forward. You, of course, you're doing a good job getting the word out through LinkedIn and places like that. But you know, do, do you see yourselves as... I guess, I guess this, these trusted advisors, so you're building out your repository of knowing which sources are out there and, and sort of what the quality level is, and then you find out what the needs are of the of the buyers. And you also, you're trying to activate, you're trying to connect these people and do some matchmaking. Is that right? Yeah. Uh, I mean, all those things are are absolutely right. I mean, some of, some of what we do is very focused on pricing. So for example, um, you know, we were looking at a retail use case and there was 138 data sets that feed into one particular market segmentation um, activity. And, um, you know, what we found is that, you know, you could find the same data set on multiple exchanges at different prices. Hmm. And that to me, and by the way, I would say that probably about a third of the exchanges or maybe 40%, won't even give you the price. You have to actually inquire. You have to send an email saying, hey, I'm interested. Can you tell me the price? Yeah. What kind of efficient market is that when you can't, you know, I want to go into the grocery store. <laughs> Enterprise I software. I want to look at the produce <laughs> and I want to know what the price is. I want to be able to see the quality right there, right? Right. And and so we don't, we don't see that happening. So one of the things that we do want to illuminate is, you know, that it's hard. So let us help you make it easy. And, you know, you should know that you could buy the same thing in two different places at two different prices. Mm -hmm. um, we see the same thing on a quality side, right? So we have lots of conversations. Number one complaint is like, I'll get my sample and my, my total data set doesn't look like my sample. And it takes me six months to work with the vendor to get it to the quality that we want that we can use. And it's like, okay, well, you just lost six months. You know what you want to do with it. You know, so is there a better vendor, better supplier that can provide you what you need at a, at a higher fill rate than what you were getting before? Match algorithms, another thing. It's like, I want to find duplicate um, patients in my hospitals, mm. right? So how am I, how do I do that? What's the best algorithms out there? You know, what's going to help me match um, one patient versus another. I mean, these are the examples. We spent two years in our team talking to as many people have talked to us about the buying of data hmm. and what their problems were. And so we're trying to make that now. We don't want to be consultants, but we do want to be Sherpas. But we want to do that through technology. So we're trying to set our community up. So not only are we Sherpas, but that they can help each other. Yeah, no, that's great. And there's a lot of information out there now. So th this is a fast evolving space, I would say. Well, let's bring in our buddy, Damian Black of SQL Stream. Damian, you've been in the enterprise software world for a while. And Andy just cracked me up by saying, oh, what kind of efficient market is that if you don't know what the price tag is? So I'm like, oh, sounds like enterprise software. <laughs> like, tell us about <laughs> your use case. Uh, how bad is the pain? How much money do you have? <laughs> we'll figure out a price. But uh, what are your thoughts about this whole concept of data exchanges, especially, as I mentioned, in light of third-party cookies apparently going away and that being a fairly disruptive force for marketers? What do you think, Damien? Yeah, um, I, I don't want to, to drill into the uh, whether it's ethical or not the pricing of enterprise software. It, it definitely does seem to be uh, um, you know, depending on how much pain people have. But yeah, as I was listening through to... Uh, the kind of challenges that um, you're trying to address. There were some questions that, that came to mind. So maybe Andy, you can help me. First thing that I was thinking about is if you if you are bringing data to sell, um, do you um, license it for different use cases? I mean, do you sell subsets of it? How, how do you control for which use cases or purposes the data are gonna be used? So we, we connect buyers and sellers. So we actually are not part of the exchange, which is, you know, which gives us sort of an independence, if you will. So we don't make money from the buyers or the sellers. Hmm. So what we're trying to do is make a more efficient transaction between the buyers and the sellers, a higher transparency, if you will. Um, so that's... So, but if you, so we're talking to a seller. I understood that. So we're look, looking at a seller that has some data wants to monetize it um 
so one as a seller of data i would imagine one of the first things you're thinking about it, talking to the point that um, eric just mentioned about the value of things in the enterprise the value of the data will vary tremendously based on on the use cases right that it's going to be put for 100%. and and the licensing therefore that's that it's going to go uh, going to be licensed for so i was wondering you know, would you advise the sellers of the data about how to best monetize that and what sort of steps or processes would you go through? Yeah, so we have, um, right now, I think we're up to 270 suppliers that are in our, um, that are in our, our community. And we, we see our job as, you know, and we, we have lots of discussions with them and asking them, like where where are your customers getting the most value out of your data? What types of use cases? What industries? And so then what we can do is then um, connect them into our use cases so you can directly connect those together. And ultimately what we wanna do, we don't do this yet, we just make the connection, but ultimately we want the community to speak, to say, these are the, the vendors that we've had the best um, luck with from, you know, maybe it's fill rate or, you know, maybe, maybe it's match rate or, you know, whatever, whatever it is related to that use case, why are you buying this particular, um, this particular data set? What that does is obviously it highlights those who are doing a good job, but what it should do in the market is drive those who aren't doing such a great job or articulating better that they can do a great job to bring their quality up or to show that they're just as good or better than anybody else that's out there. So we're trying to create that transparency without having any, with being very objective in terms of helping them um, get better. Hmm. And um, you're creating a, a metadata repository, is that correct? So that people can... Can that be yeah, I mean, it's a huge access. Yeah, thank you, Damian. That's a that's a huge piece of what we're trying to do is create that metadata network so that we can understand the relationship between the different databases, how it's being used, and um, you know the the what what who's getting the most value out of it. So when we think about sort of connecting all those data points together, it gives us a very um, a, a very unique way of comparing data sets. Hmm. And, and yeah, part of that sense. is, yeah. so, so part yeah. of that process is, um, it's not only just, re not only recording the various uh, sources of data, but it's also the people and organizations that are consuming it. So you, you, you have that kind of, that graph or spider's web of, 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 of you know, like publishing and subscribing or, providing and um and consuming is that correct yeah so i in you know from what i've learned about about data you know in my my little career um is that if you have information if you have data about how people behave or or how um um you know one piece of data is impacting another or an algorithm that repository of information is incredibly valuable we can then say okay here's what's too expensive here's what's poor quality here's what's missing and we can help source that into the community so having that comprehensive database about that data is a, a is is a specific objective of what we're trying to accomplish all to help both the buyer and the seller interact in a more efficient way. Hmm. I know you're working in the financial uh, in services industry and financial data, and I actually had had some firsthand experience of where this would be would have been extremely valuable. Working with an organization that shall remain um, nameless that was basically uh, trying to start up a, a fraud detection service for banking transactions. And part of the value prop that they were um, advertising was that as you brought your banking transactions to this particular service, we would automate the detection through machine learning of the various financial transactions. The problem they had was getting started you need to get a critical mass of customers so you have enough data so you can actually start detecting the fraudulent patterns and providing the value so it's a chicken and egg problem yeah 
being able to identify sources of data and that sort of situation really would have saved them literally years and millions of dollars. <laughs> well, yeah, nice commercial. Uh, thanks. I mean, I, I mean, if we can solve for problems like that, you know, reduce that inefficiency, shorten that time frame. I mean, I, I think we'll bring a lot of value to the uh, to the markets. I think bootstrapping is a really important imp important area where companies, you know, need to get going because there are many cases where you get enough data, you know, it becomes um, self feeding and self sufficient. But getting started is is really hard. Mm. Yeah, is that something that you see just to kind of get people off the ground as a use case or is it more mature companies looking to you know as you suggest figure out what is the fair price figure out what is the market value of this stuff yeah, something a, like that yeah i mean it's it's i mean you hit eric the, the nail on the head in terms of our personas of the of our target customers right so there's those who are up and running and now are trying to get more refined about what they're doing get better, you know, lower costs or really the right quality. They're willing to pay for high quality data, the right price. I mean, so it's not just about decreasing the price. It's about the right, right ratio of quality to cost. So that that's clear um, what what's going on in that market. And then we have tons of examples of of people who are like, I, I think I, I'm not sure if I gave this earlier, but like in the higher education market, you know, wanting to understand fraud in the higher education market. And, you know, how do I do that? How do I start? You know, like you got to scour the web. You know, it's it, we want to make it easy for those who want to start. So that's that's our objective um, there. So but you hit the two personas right on the head. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. And I'm thinking to myself, too, you, know, you look at the evolution of Google, you look at the emergence of open AI, you look at the emergence of things like BARD which can see real time. Now they focused on building out real time connectors and you can't get some interesting information these days from Google, but it's only at, you know, maybe that 10,000 foot level. And I think if you want to get down to that, you know, street level view, let's call it to, to build upon your metaphor earlier, the use case of the sides of buildings, that's when you do want to get into purchasing a data set that, you know, you can trust or at least reasonably trust to kind of get you over that hump because you know we're in an age of scale right now. And if you come out with some new product or service and you can't scale it, well, you're not going to get very far and someone else is going to figure it out. I mean, I, I kind of see that happening with BARD eclipsing open AI. And it wasn't even that long ago that it, this all started happening. So you get these big companies out there really working hard to change the game and they are changing the game. But I think this is a missing piece. Real quick, we've got about a minute and a half left. Uh, what do you think, Andy? Yeah, I I totally uh, I totally agree with that. I mean, you use the example um, around the sides of buildings. I may have talked about that off air. So just let me, you know, that that's in when we one of the questions that we ask um, everybody that we talk to is what's missing, what's too expensive, what's poor quality, like what's what are the problems. And I'm just totally fascinated. The one that come, keeps coming back in different conversations is about, hey, can you find a vendor who can give us, a, you know, side views of, of buildings? And it's like, okay, well, Oops. really tell whether or not there's problems with those buildings in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of insuring those buildings. So I think there's there's a lot of that that we're seeing that we can really help companies sort of sort through, figure out through our um, um, through our services. Hmm. That's great stuff. Well, there's a lot to be known out there if you're trying to plan out a new business, if you're trying to figure out a way to grow your business. Like I mentioned, these third party cookies going away that is a huge deal. That's just pulling the rug out from underneath digital marketers everywhere, and they're going to need to figure out ways to solve for that. But we'll figure out more of that after the break. Don't touch that. I'll be right back. You are listening to DM Radio. Welcome back to DM Radio. Here's your host, Eric Cavanaugh. 
All right, ladies and gentlemen, back here on DM Radio, talking all things data exchanges, share and share alike, right? Exchange and exchange alike, data aplenty. That's the title of our show today. We've got Andy Hanna of Blue Street Data and 1486 Labs, our analyst friend, Eugene Burke, and of course, Damian Black of SQL Stream. And Andy, you've been building this database of use cases, which I think is very valuable because the use case, just for those who are not in the industry, just means what it sounds like it means a case for using a particular technology what value can you get uh certainly i get the pricing one also population health i mean you talked about uh healthcare as a as a vector if you will or healthcare as an industry you're you're looking at and it's so incredibly complex but you can if as you start looking at data from a population to population perspective you will learn there are differences between Houston and Pittsburgh and San Diego and other places where the diets are different the weather is different the culture is different and so that has different manifestations in terms of healthcare and that's one of the examples of use cases right andy yeah you, exactly eric and that one that you just named is exactly the reason why we went into that particular use case is because the treatment plans are completely different not only everything that you name but if you look at the different regions treatment plans are very different from one region to the next by disease state totally fascinating but how do you sift through all that how do you you know can because there's 50 large pharma companies are all interested in the same thing can we go for those 50 pharma companies can we take a lot of that friction or that that process that they have to go through out of it streamline it so that it makes it easy for them to evaluate one provider versus another this is an example if you had an efficient market that would take care of itself but we need to be the catalyst for that um, and that's that's one of the things I see not only being the Sherpa, as Eugene mentioned, but, you know, being the catalyst for how do we solve these problems? Yeah, that's a great term. I love the the concept of the catalyst because the catalyst activates something. And uh, maybe, Eugene, I'll bring you in. You know, there's this whole concept of data literacy that a lot of people are talking about these days. And it makes a lot of sense because if you don't understand the basic concepts of data management and movement analysis, et cetera, you're going to have a hard time wrapping your head around what it all means. And I think that uh, these data exchanges are going to foster much greater data literacy, specifically as they as the data aligns to particular use cases. So once you learn why you want to have this piece of data, it's like, oh, I get it. Like the sides of buildings, well, if you can see an aerial view, you can see the roof, but you can't see the side. Is there damage on the side? Is there mold? Things of this nature. And these days, I mean, the processing power is absolutely spectacular. What companies can do. Now, they're getting very sophisticated insurance companies at being able to look at storms coming in, run exposure lists, help them better manage their resources, knowing what's coming, figuring out who the most likely people are to go to check on first. I mean, even the drone side of the equation, it blows my mind where, you know, I heard from someone at a conference a couple of years ago, maybe three, four years ago, they went from char charging or costing like two to $3,000 per house just to go inspect and go up and down and look all around mm -hmm. to like $200 mm -hmm. and more accurate because they have camera views and everything. It's like, oh, wow, that's the kind of advancement that makes a senior executive do backflips in the office. Like, yay, we figured out a new way to solve this problem. So I think that these data exchanges are is thanks to 1486 Labs and Blue Street Data. I think it's going to help really encourage and and foster more education and more awareness around data literacy. What do you think, Eugene? I think it's an excellent point, Eric, because the in this state of the market's development, one of the really valuable services that Andy and his team are providing is helping new data buyers. Uh, avoid gotchas, avoid being damaged, you know, avoid being burned. And data literacy is a key part of that. And so I imagine, Andy, that that your customers come to you with a use case and have you ever gone back and forth and back and forth to help them refine that use case to help them avoid being burned? Yeah, I mean, all of our use cases that we've developed so far, um, and there's 16 of them are our goal by the end of the year is to have 60, 60 up. None of them are done in a vacuum. It's, you know, it's not a, a, a group of, of our students that are, are sitting saying, hmm, this would be interesting. Let's build this. 
Um, it's they got to find a, a person in the industry that's had this problem or has solved this problem. And why, you know, how did you do it? What type of algorithms were you using? What type of first party data? What type of third party data? You know, it's it's getting what was the value proposition that you had when you started this? Um, did you get it when you came through at the end? You know, these are these are the questions that we ask and we get them vetted and they don't go up on the uh, uh, on the platform until some expert has vetted them. And, you know, I love that about what we're doing. So it's not vacuum. It's it's truly digging in deep and it's going to get better because the community should contribute to that. So we again, we're a catalyst. We got good, really good use cases. But I want people in the community to say, hey, you didn't even mention this algorithm or you can boost that algorithm with this type of technology or, or, or. And so the community starts to contribute. You know, nobody wants to give away their secrets, but hey, we all want to reduce fraud. Mm. We all, all want better health outcomes, right? So there's plenty of use cases out there where the community should contribute to getting a better outcome. Yeah, that's a really good example too. And you're reminding me that, you know, we're in this new, era of crowdsourcing things and we talked about open ai and how they just basically scraped whatever they could find on the public internet and used all that to train their algorithms and to build their large language model which is very impressive make no mistake about it but uh, you're going to need the personal touch you're going to need the quality assurance you're going to need the reality check and that comes from people and having people involved and having people pay attention now the good news is a lot of the tedious stuff is is now being able to to get executed by the machines and i'll throw this first over to andy and then maybe damien just to, to comment real quick but uh tagging like labeling data so i was talking to a gentleman uh from boston who is one of the preeminent experts on labeling and you know using um uh, you know, machine learning, but using people to say, okay, this is an apple, that's a bear, this is something else. And he, the point he made is that uh, very, very, very few people are good at that task. Mm. Very few. He said his experience was about 2% of the people that you hire to do that are good at that thing. Well, guess what? It's a really boring task. I mean, as boring as could possibly be. And so no one really wants to do that. Uh, but luckily, the machines are coming in to be able to tackle some of these tedious tasks. But there's always going to be something that the human has to do, the reality check on, and if necessary, pull the emergency brake. Um, Andy, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, a, a couple of things. One is you reminded me of what how Yahoo started, which is, you know, the request came in and there was a bunch of people in a room. Right. And said, who's going to answer this question? <laughs> I've heard this story. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, you know, so, but, and, but in today's age, I mean, that's, you know, part of the risk is using these LLMs, you know, you're, it's only as good as the the data that it's trained on, of course. And one of the, one of the requests that we're getting is, and not only from the buyers, but from the sellers as well is, you know, um, hey, do you certify that that our data is or that they're buying or selling is ethically sourced? Is it, you know, is it um, something that that our purchasing, you know, our procurement process is going to let go through? Because now that's what we're seeing a lot of is the friction in the purchasing process is that people are worried that you're going to buy data that's not what it really means or that it was bought off the dark web somehow integrated into a much larger consumer database. I mean, there's so much worry about that. Um, so that, I don't know how to solve for that problem yet, but it is definitely one that's on our top 10 because it just keeps coming up and up and up. So is it humans? You know, I like to think about it that we become editors, right? We become mm. super editors that we, AI is not going to replace us. I'm one of the people who are sit there and say, it's an augmentation of ourselves, right? We, it's not a replacement. And so if I can have three brains because of AI, Hey, I'm much better at what I do. I'm much more efficient editor. So I think that's sort of how we're going to get to it. Yes. Human involvement, but not maybe at the early Yahoo stages. Yeah, that's a real good point. Damien, we have just one minute left of closing thoughts from you. Well, I think an interesting uh, point to bring up about tagging of data, because that is the critical thing in terms of getting any kind of accuracy and efficiency in all of these exploding machine learning models. And most of the breakthroughs that are happening are coming from people that are working out how to kind of um, bootstrap around or paper over the issues you've got where you're working with insufficient tagging of data. So 
yeah, I, I think that's going to be a so the tags themselves are a whole new class of metadata that are going to have markets um, in them in of themselves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, I'll throw out there, folks, uh, hop online to LinkedIn and look up my article about uh, the end of Wall Street. I was being a bit ironic about that. But I talked all about how some of these hedge funds get access to exhaust data, tremendous amounts of data, and they can know which vendors are going to hit their market and which aren't. So they know who to bet on on the stock market. <laughs> wow. Mm. Stick that in your pipe and smoke it. Folks, we'll talk to you next time you've been listening to DM Radio. All right, folks, time for the podcast bonus here on DM Radio. We've been talking all about data exchanges with uh, Andy Hanna of 1486 Labs, 1486 Labs and Blue Street Data, Damian Black of SQL Stream, and our analyst buddy Eugene Burke. And, uh, you know, there are lots of changes in the job market these days. Lots of jobs are going away. I looked at a graphic the other day. It was pretty funny of uh, the jobs market and all the different industries where it went up. And there was one in the whole stack where it went down by 5%. And that was information. <laughs> I was like, oh, no, that's my industry. No wonder we're feeling the pain. Uh, and we've seen it, man, the, the data, the analytics, all the software companies in the space. I mean, almost everything at some point is in the crosshairs of these large language models. So that could be one reason why. But I'd love to hear from each of the guests, uh, their thoughts on maybe young folks or even middle-aged people looking for work now. What are some cool places to look in, in, in this space? Andy, I'll throw it over to you first, because you deal with these buyers and sellers, are there, you know, if someone wants to get into that, who do they go to? Do they go to like a big financial services company or like, how do you get a job like that? Yeah, I, I think one of the things that's interesting because I spend a lot of time on college campus um, that, you know, it, it's not like there's an analytics group that comes and um, recruits or the accountants come, you know, the marketing people come, the finance people come. It's um, there's so much networking that has to go on if you want those types of jobs. And but they're there. I mean, they're available, but you just have to work at them harder. What I think the number one skill that I'm seeing that these employers want is the ability to understand technology. So this this means they know how to code and not because they want them to come in code, but because they want to be able to have that conversation with the with the data scientists who are coding, but then can have an understanding of the business. So there that that crossover, I understand technology, I understand the business outcome. If you can speak both languages, I think the the sky's your limit. Hmm. That's a great point. Maybe Eugene, I'll throw it over to you. Those liaisons, that well, it's like the data stewards in the data world, right? The mm -hmm. people who understand the data, but they also understand the business, and they can have a conversation with both of them and hopefully sort out whatever differences they have. That's a really good role. That's a really good set of skills to have. What do you think, Eugene? I, I would agree. I think that so as we're experiencing this inflection point from reporting to analytics, machine learning to AI, the quality of your data foundation is ever more important. And mm. you cannot do AI on dirty data. You get hallucinations. So when I interview business analysts, I immediately try to understand how well do they understand the role and function of data in the enterprise and how well, what are their data literacy skills? How well do they understand the challenges of working with data? And can they jump right into the fray? And if they can, then we have that next conversation about, okay, what do what your SQL skills look like? You know, have you ever done uh, sourcing a requirement from business objective and, and, and traced it all the way back to technical prerequisites? Those are uh, skills that you can go to work immediately. Hmm. That's good information too. And uh, Damien, I'll throw it over to you. For thoughts, you know, one of the, the trends that I see happening here, especially with generative AI, but even before that, um, with other kinds of AI, but even absent AI, is this fusing of roles. And so you, know, you used to have multiple roles in these in these organizations. Someone did the lead gen, someone did the marketing strategy, someone did the the events or whatever, someone did all these different tasks. And I think you're going to start seeing more of that fall on individual people just because there are layoffs. I mean, you lay off 10 people out of a you know 50 person company. Well, either the work those 10 people was doing was meaningless or you have to get the other 40 people to do what they were doing. 
And it's like, it's an amazing time for a business process re-engineering. Quite frankly, it's an amazing time for kind of changing business models and coming up with new ways of doing things to ride the waves that exist and to chase the money that does exist. But I mean, what are your thoughts for the the significant changes in the markets that we're seeing and you know how data and understanding data can help people um, get jobs and do fruitful things? What do you think, Damien? Well, I hope you're right for a start, because um, I think, you know, when I started off my career, there was a lot more focus on Renaissance people that understood more than just one particular silo. They would understand across all of those silos and how they work together. And and part of, you know, what, you know, one was expected to do is to is to to learn the various different functions and disciplines so you could be a, a better rounded individual. I think for a long time, we've had a lot of uh, focus on on very sort of specific vertical siloization of jobs and roles and recruitment followed along the, that path. But um, but maybe now we're going to see that revert back to when people are starting to value uh, breadth and, and flexibility. Um, and maybe AI will actually help in that process because you can provide, you can fill in the gaps and, uh, of knowledge with systems that can help um um, provide you examples or answer questions or or, or pointers and take you in the right direction. Yeah. I mean, from a personal perspective, I'm actually looking right now. I sold SQL Stream to Thales, so I'm looking for my next project myself. And my main challenge is finding something that's you know going to be interesting and challenging, and where someone would appreciate the breadth of skills rather than just individual you know particular verticalization of one skill. Yeah. That's right. Well, it's a crazy, wild, woolly world out there, folks. Uh, but there is a lot of opportunity. I know that for sure. There's a lot of change. I remember learning that in uh, in Mandarin, the character for chaos is very, very similar to the character for opportunity. So these are similar things. But folks, hop online anytime. Send me an email if you want to be on the show. Info at dmradio.biz. We'll talk to you next time. You have been listening to DM Radio. <laughs>